fully coupling. Thank you. And uh, I have to thank, uh, thank the organizers for, organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk here. And uh, as you see, it's about the small letter that you by dynamical decoupling. And I think uh, many people... Is your mic on? The, the mic on you. Is it on? It is on. Is this better? This is better. Okay. Yeah. So Okay, so here's, uh, I'll, I'll mostly focus on the dephasing qubit, which is the familiar system. Either it's like a spin boson dephasing characterized by the coupling of a qubit to bosonic modes, or you could think of a classical fluctuating field, Gaussian random variable along the z. And here are the formulas that, expl uh, that uh, describe the coherence error. Let me So the, uh, co the measure of coherence I have is the, off the, the decay of the off-diagonal elements. There's a decay, and the decay value or the logarithm of the ratio of these two is given by this formula, where lambda of omega is related to the spectral density in case of the bosonic path, or the power spectrum for the Gaussian random variable. So I define this object here, which is sort of the noise spectrum divided by omega squared, the spectral measure. And to this logarithm of the ratio of the coherence, I call coherence error, so or this error. And this is the starting point for me. Okay, so there are many things that we can learn from the spectrum, even for the free, freely decaying particle, freely decaying qubit. Like, I know that the coupling strength is going to correspond to the strength of the coherence loss. The cutoff frequency is going to correspond to a coherence time scale. The softness of the cutoff is going to correspond to approximately defined time scales because it's going to change the, effectively change the uh, cutoff frequency. An interesting thing that happens is that the power law of the noise near zero frequency is going to uh, affect the long time behavior. So here's the model that I'll be using sometimes in this talk for the spectral density. It's a power law here and a decay with a omega c. K is the softness of the uh, the, the cutoff. Now, this is still an exponential decay, so it's not the one over omega squared decay that you saw in some of the talks. And the famous cases, omic corresponds to s equal to one. This is sort of pinkish, or one over f is s equal to minus one, and a flat noise would correspond to s equal to zero. Of course, this is flat, but with a cutoff, so I don't, this is not exactly white noise, it's just flat. Okay. So here's just an example of two different uh, cutoff frequencies and see what it does to coherence, a difference of an order of magnitude in the scale uh, changes the behavior of coherence. This, is, this should be very familiar to you from all of the talks that we've seen so now. And that's the spectral density for which this was done. Okay. So let me just give a couple of more slides on the free evolution. So here is different what I'm plotting. This is the last plot is the coherence, the function of time. And here I have the logarithm of coherence loss. So it starts from something small and then grows. And there are different cases, the supraomic, omic, flat, and something which is almost like one over f, but not exactly. And there's different behaviors. In the, th the three top cases where the uh, noise is omic or subomic, there is an unbounded, decay, uh, unbounded increase in error. While in this case, there is a coherence saturation or residual coherence. So this, these are like ohmic, and in this case we get a coherence saturation. This guy never loses his coherence, so maybe we should use his name as something as opposed to ohmic, okay? So that the message is that different environments, different power laws will correspond to different, 
coherent behaviors, especially in the long time, and for sure in the short time as well. So the more you know about the spectral density or the environment in general, the more you can do to suppress it. So I, I just give you two sort of general approaches to this optimization or optimization for suppressing errors. The first example is about continuous control and you constrain the total energy acting on the system and you try to compensate the noise for the first order knowing that the phasing spectrum, this is a work by Gordon Kruiski and Lidar 2008 and a new one by uh, the Kruiski group. Or you could just go back to the decoupling model and try to find the best timings for your pulses to optimize the DD sequence for a given spectral density. And some of the work that Mike Bersig did in the, at NIST was related to that. They did an optimization, even empirical, based on the spec that they had. And also, Pacina and Uri did something like that based on the power laws of the spectral density. And this work is also based on the power laws of the spectral density. So there's all these optimization methods and improvements <laughs> that you can come up with to improve either decoupling with pulses or just continuous control over the system to just suppress the errors. But is there a fundamental limit on the best errors that you could achieve with unitary control? So I call this unitary control because what you change on the system is the Hamiltonian or just apply unitary pulse. You're not going to do measurements or reset the entropy in any ways. Okay? So here's the premise of dynamical decoupling, which is going to be my focus that you know very little about the environment, except that you probably know something about the cutoff frequency. You know the algebraic structure of the noise, which in my case is going to be the phasing, that is noise is proportional to Z. You might know the noise parallel. And you have some limitations on control, which is very important. For example, you, you have limited pulse rate, timing constant. You cannot apply your, pulse, your pulses infinitely fast. You normally you don't get delta-shaped uh, delta pulses also. So you have limits on the speed of your pulses. And you also have pulse imperfection that you apply a pulse and you get something else. I will focus only on the first one, which is the bare bones uh, constraint. These, things, these only make things worse. And there's tons of literature on dynamical decoupling now. I've only mentioned some more theoretical ones here that relate to this premise. Okay. So, the pulse sequence has a starting point and an end point. Starts at time zero, ends at time t. There are end pulses in between. And there are two ways of characterizing the control constraints. One is to think about the bounded rate, which is that the pulses cannot be applied too close to each other. So there's a minimum separation between the times, which is sort of natural to have infinite rates because it's going to break your system. So there's a technological bound on the minimum interval. The other sort of obvious constraint is that in digital pulsing, the times are going to be multiples of a resolution time. This sort of seems beyond what we would normally consider. But when you're applying many pulses and you try to make the pulses very close to each other, these, both of these constraints become important. And they're very similar, actually. So again, the error that I'm going to look at is the uh, decay of the off-diagonal terms. And here's how the control propagator for the system looks like. It is basically something that fluctuates. It didn't get updated. So I'm sorry. This should be sigma x to power y t plus 1. Just something that fluctuates between sigma x and identity. And y of t would switch between plus, minus, plus and minus 1. And y of t is like a propagator, except that it's and minus 1, as opposed to being a C2 operator. Okay. So this is a, uh, like the setting of my problem, and it's very simple. And before, again, I give you <laughs> like the approach, let me give you one more introductory slide. So there, I would like to think that there are three objectives in dynamical decoupling. The first one, which is probably the most heavily researched one, is to just achieve the best fidelity for a given time. And normally, you would tell yourself that I can apply as many pulses as I want. And there's a perturbative solution to this problem, characterized by all these uh, named sequences. The other problem is that you would try to do the best fidelity in the shortest time. And you have physical constraints because you cannot apply things too fast. In fact, you, have, you start with building blocks, which are pulses or like intervals, and you want to combine these building blocks to get the best fidelity. This is sort of like a gating problem where you want to do some operation quickly and nicely. The other problem, 
And I'll talk about these two problems, the last two ones. Is that you want to do something nicely and you want to do it forever. You want to take, as we've heard a few times already, you, you can maintain coherence for a long time. So what is the best you can do and if you can do it for a very long time? So you see all these whimsical uh, acronyms and that's just the signature of the NMR influence. I'm sorry about that. Okay. So we've seen the filter function and people have uh, said, like Mike said that he prefers filter functions to the Cayley graph. Uh, you should be careful for uh, what you wish for, I'll, as I'll show you soon. So here's the overlap integral. So the error is characterized by an overlap between the spectral measure and the filter function. And filter function is really the Fourier transform of the sequence propagator, uh, or the phase of the actual propagator. And there's a very nice compact formula for the filter function for a given sequence. It's just the sum of the exponential. And there are different oscillat oscillatory terms. TJs, if you remember, they were the timings of the sequence omega is the argument of the filter function. So you can actually come up with something very similar to this for, the, for a continuous control case. In that case, the, uh, you will get an integral, but it will all still be related to the Fourier transform of the phase of the continuous propagator. At least for dephasing, it's easy to derive that approximation. It requires a Born approximation, and it's uh, used for continuous control uh, optimization scenarios. So let me just say a few general things about the filter function. So you could, there are two ways of thinking about this object. One is the usual idea that it's an overlap between the filter function and the spectral measure, that you want to suppress some part of the spectral measure by making the function small in those areas, and things like that. Or you could think of it as a weighted L2 norm of the filter function. And weighted L2, uh, the weight here is the spectral measure. Okay, well that's just another mathematical term for it, of course. The, the thing about overlap is that if the frequency is small, if the cutoff frequency is small, you don't need to worry about the other parts of the spectral density beyond the cutoff, and you just need to make the filter function small throughout this interval. And this is the essence of perturbative decoupling. Now, and if omega c is small, you, you just need to have a look at the uh, expansion of the filter function near zero. And this is the essence of all of these named decoupling sequences. So for example, the error, and you get an order of error suppression, which I think Daniel defined in terms of the magnitude expansion. But here you can define in terms of the filter function, it's the same thing. So for free evolution, the order of error suppression is zero because the filter function is proportional to, or echo, which is just sequence of equally, uh, equally distance pulses is one, for CPMG it's two. For UDD and CD, you could get any desired integer. And the time scales of the sequence usually manifest themselves as pseudo peaks in the, uh, if you plot the filter function. But anyways, filter function properties. You've seen many of these, I mean, you can just plot it and play with it and you see all of these things, there is nothing. Uh, that simple intuition doesn't tell you about this. Okay, so let me bring in the uh, control constraints here, which for me the main, most important is the minimum interval between the pulses. That's a fundamental time limit in the control that you get. And you, it would be a good idea to use it as a unit. So let's just do it use it as a unit for, of time, define these dimensionless parameters delta, and then rewrite the filter function and get a polynomial in terms of this variable, which is some oscillatory function in terms of the minimum switching time, or minimum integer. So get this polynomial. And if you have a digital constraint in the uh, pulse timings, you get a normal polynomial here. Otherwise, you get something which is called a Munch polynomial, which is a polynomial with non-integer exponents. I didn't know such things existed before I, well, looked it up. <laughs> so it turns out that with, for digital pulsings, you can expand the polynomial and factor it to look like this. So starting uh, from zero and going up to time n plus one times the resolution time, there are two to the n possibilities of have, uh, different sequences. There are two to the n different sequences that you could apply in this, along this line. So because there are n slots for applying or not applying the pulse. And if you write the polynomial and you, if you try to, and if you factor it out, you'll see that each sequence corresponds to a choice of a little bit polynomial, which is just this simple polynomial where efficient could be one or minus one. And they're called little bit polynomials and they're 
of interest to mathematicians. So in dynamical decoupling, we are interested in the filter function, which is just a polynomial, which is a very simple object. In fact, we are only interested in how it behaves near zero, where, which corresponds to the z equal to one complex plane. That's how they look like. These are polynomials, filter functions. And we are interested in this part. It turns out that as you increase the degree, this uh, circle here actually shrinks. There are many roots here, but you don't see them because they are, they are of density zero. So there's a very large concentration of roots right on v equal to one, and the rest of it is just stuff, okay? Obviously, you can see of many theorems that can, are trying to get out of this picture. And, well, we won't talk about this, but okay. So, as I said, the uh, error uh, is an L2 norm. And the L2 norm, you can show that it's larger than an L1 norm squared with some uh, normalization. So the error of a decoupling sequence is always larger than some, uh, the L1 norm of some filter polynomial. So that's a nice way of thinking about this because I have the polynomial, it's a um, complex function. I'm going to look at how it behaves on the unit circle and then I'm going to, and the interval of from zero to the cutoff frequency is going to correspond to an arc on the unit circle. So I could just find lower bounds this way. Okay, so people have, mathematicians have thought about similar problems, and that's a good thing. So there is this Littlewood conjecture that the L1 norm of nth degree polynomials on the unit circle grows at least as long n, which was proved in 81 by Magee, Pinion, and Smith, independently by Konyagin. Then it was extended to the case where you don't have uh, the regular polynomial, you have uh, the Moon's polynomials, but you put a condition for the minimum separation of the exponent. This was proved in 96 by Nazarov. And then more recently, a similar result was obtained. Well, a lower bound was obtained for the subarcs of the unit circle by Erdei and Borwein, <coughs> which after our suggestion, uh, Tomas Erdei proved that you could say something about the Moon's polynomials on a subarc of the unit circle, uh, which is basically that's why I have a math paper with him. <laughs> Anyways. Let me just, so this is the more familiar control regime. Uh, no, this is the slow control regime, which is the undesirable control regime. That is when the control time scale is too slow for decoupling. In that case, the L1 norm or L2 norm corresponds to a full integral over the whole unit circle, digital pulsing or when they are separated by at least one, which immediately implies that if such is the case, then decoupling is not going to behave well. The error for decoupling will behave at best as log n squared, where n is the number of pulses. So if the minimum switching time times the spectral density cutoff is larger than two pi, decoupling doesn't work. This is a familiar result. I'm not saying that this is fancy, but it's nice to prove it. And tau here, again, is not the total time. It's only the interval, <coughs> the minimum interval that you can get. So the control time scale, which is tau m, and the environmental bandwidth are the only factors that get into this. So that's sort of nice, but we need the, uh, the other regime, which is the regime where decoupling works. So what do we get there? This is what you get. That here is a one over tau squared dependence here, and here is a uh, inverse exponential function, which is uh, an essential singularity. That is when you, when you decrease tau, it goes widely to zero, but not widely enough. So this is, an inter uh, this is a non-perturbative non result and is based on the result on polynomials. It gives you a lower bound on the error for decoupling, which is a non-perturbative result. Again, I, I repeat it, because there's no, there's, you cannot expand this function in perturbation theory. This is an essential singularity, you can't expand it. And, in a, and it indirectly, it proves that there is no threshold for decoupling. Let me just uh, explain this a little bit. So the threshold theorem has to do with what you, uh, the best error you can get with uh, given resources. And it says that if the given resources are better than something, then you can get error zero in finite, well, not in finite, you can approach error zero. This is telling you that if your resource, which is the minimum switching uh, interval, 
is finite, you can never get zero. You can get very good. You can get very small, but not zero. So there is no threshold here. So there is some thinking that maybe you can break this result for, the, for a finite dimensional environment, but we are not sure. There is a similar result that you can get for the, for the cases where you have a continuous filter function for uh, a continuous control, and you can still get a filter function with some approximation. And you get a similar result, except that instead of the minimum interval, you get uh, the maximum field strength. So you get a similar no threshold result for continuous control. Okay? So that was sort of um, anticlimactic. <laughs> so let me just uh, show, explain to you, I mean, uh, show you how you actually see that. Result. There are many different sequences or sequence families like CDD, UDD. You, to get order alpha, you use two to the alpha pulses, take two to the alpha tau times. With UDD, you, to get to order alpha, you need O of alpha pulses, and it takes O of alpha squared times tau time. Now, tau in UDD is the duration of the first interval. So if you take the first interval, plug in the formula, and look at the total time, it will scale with alpha squared. You can, you can see it. Okay. But uh, UDD uses far fewer pulses and shorter time than CDD. Okay, but are fewer pulses better? Well, sometimes you need to go to long times and you are willing to apply many pulses. Like we, we are hearing uh, here thousands of pulses, hundreds of pulses. People are uh, willing to do it as long as the coherence time is extended. So maybe people actually like it. Maybe it's even necessary. But the reality is that, I mean, no, you don't want to apply too many pulses anyways because there are pulses and there are other things that your system will heat up, things like that. But anyways, so fewer pulses are not necessarily better. They could be better. It depends on your control objective. So here's a plot of UDD errors when you constrain the minimum switching time. And these are different UDD sequences and this, is, this axis is the minimum interval in dimensionless unit, this is the error, and this is an, uh, a lower bound that we found. You, you see the essential singularity popping up here again, which corresponds to this, da to this dashed curve. Now, what happened is that there is no threshold. You have to push it back to get lower error. So there's no single omega c tau value that you would expect everything to go down. There's no common inflection point. And it turns out that the optimal, ta uh, optimal duration time for a sequence, for a UDD sequence, is proportional to this. So it scales with one C squared. Okay. So if you want to do longer than that, or then uh, UDD will not work in this case. But it still gives you a nice, a nice uh, bound. And this bound is actually very similar to the best, to the lower bound that we proved. And in fact, when I uh, showed the UDD sequence to, my, uh, to our math mathematician, colleague, he was excited because he thought that it related immediately to some conjectures in number theory. Well, I don't know what he did with it, so. Anyways. So, what, let me just show you this one more. So if you fix the omega c tau here, and you start applying higher and higher order UDD sequences, there's an always, always an optimal value for the order of the sequence that works, which is this picture. You fix the minimum switching time, and then you start plotting all possible UDD errors that you get, starting from order one, two, three, four, corresponding to longer and longer duration. And there's always an optimum uh, sequence. Okay? So the different uh, colors correspond to different uh, softness in the spectral uh, uh, density cutoff. And in all cases, I'm using an ohmic power law. So there's always an optimal value. It's not that UDD is not going to work. It, it might be that the optimal UDD sequence might be like the CPMT sequence, because it's included among the UDD sequence. There's always a better UDD sequence, depending on the sequence, on the control uh, capabilities, and the cutoff frequency. So the cutoff frequency determines the best sequence you can do. OK. So that was searching for inside a specific family of sequences, which was the uh, UDD sequence. But you don't need to be constrained to the family. You can just let go of the family, and then you get what we call the bandwidth adapted dynamical or BAD. And this is found through numerical search. It is always adapted to the spectral measure and the bandwidth of the bath. 
And you just constrain the pulse intervals to be larger than tau. And that's the main constraint. And then you keep increasing pulses to get better and better fidelities and longer times, therefore. The search space is the search space of the number of intervals that you have. You just have more intervals, you get more, uh, bigger search space, and it grows exponentially with the number of pulses. That's not good. But anyways, it's doable. You could do it. No, please. So here, this graph is a little complicated, but the nice thing about it is that it corresponds to this exciton qubit with uh, some experimental experimentally verified value. The, it's a supraomic spectral density with parallel of three, and the cutoff is at three radians uh, over picoseconds. Apparently, the experimentally available pulse widths are, are femtoseconds, and the intervals are okay. So you could do like 0.1 picoseconds as an interval, or 0.3. So the, this is the curve that I showed you before, more or less, except that the, you're already past the minimum. So the error increases as you add more pulses to the UZ sequence. The, these flat curves, they correspond to the optimization solution found through BADD. That is, you fix the minimum, the minimum switching time, and then you start looking for sequences with, say, three intervals, four intervals, five intervals, and so on, and just explore longer and longer times. It's flat. Now change the constraint to 0.1 picoseconds. Again, the UDD starts increasing after a while, but the numerical search actually improves the coherence. So using longer uh, and more pulses actually imp is improving the coherence here. I'm mentioning LODD here. LODD is a sequence uh, that was uh, discovered by, well, it's, uh, the was generated by Mike Yersek. They uh, discovered the idea. And what they did was that they fixed the total time and they just added more and more pulses. So if you add more pulses, you are inevitably going to shrink the interval. So you can always match some sequence which is going to uh, meet your constraints. And these LODDs are the LODDs that me almost me met the constraint that we had. So they're also similar to the BADD in terms of coherence. So one open question is that if you have, say, a flat or an omic with a hard cutoff, some given spectral uh, measure, is it possible to find the best sequences that satisfy the constraint, the minimum switching time constraint and NTT? And I don't know if it's possible. It would be great if someone can do it because then you could probably extend it to other spectral measures. Okay? So I want to uh, just quickly go back to a different uh, measure of complexity. One of the, uh, the control uh, complexity that I mentioned here was the time between the pulses or the pulse rate that you can apply in our system. The other measure is that people have to actually apply this pulse on, the, on their circuit. Or like, if it's just a CPMG sequence or say a simple echo sequence, it's easy, you just apply these sequences. It's very easy, you can do a simple circuit. But the more sophisticated the sequence becomes, it's harder to do it on board. You actually have to connect to a computer to program the controller, I don't know. So, you don't like it. We, um, you don't want to, like, just for keeping the coherence high, you don't want to apply, like, a big uh, electronic circuit or an F, FG. I don't know what it's called. So you have to improve the digital sequencing. And in electronics, people have been doing this since the 70s using Walsh functions, which I'll define shortly. They're just a family of piecewise constant binary valued functions, and they provide us is for semi-autonomous pulse control. Well, you can just define the sequences. You can define them either recursively, that is you start with the sequence and you double up the running time of it, and then you decide if you want the same propagator for the second part, or you want to invert the propagator. So from the WDD n, you can make WDD 2n and 2n plus 1. The difference is that this in WDD 2n plus 1, the second propagator, which if you remember it was either 1 or minus 1, is inverted. And to achieve the inversion in actual, well, this is just a representation. To a actually achieve the inversion, you might need to add a pulse or not add a pulse, depending on the parity of the sequence. So here are four examples. The other way to define them is in terms of the Rademacher functions, which are, which is defined like this. They are uh, oscillatory constant uh, square shapes with uh, frequencies that correspond to powers of two. 
So you take the number n and you look at this binary representation and then you, uh, the Walsh function for order n is given by this. It looks complicated a little bit, but the sequence are easy to make either this way or that way. And here is the uh, filter polynomial for the Walsh decoupling. So the, the idea of Walsh decoupling, I mean, the, the way it reached me was through a paper by Dave Hayes at uh, NIST Maryland and uh, in uh, Chris Monroe's group where they did this for the, their sorensen molmer gate, where they're doing a geometric gate and they want to suppress uh, frequency. Maybe I'm, uh, I'm not sure what they suppress. But they use uh, watch functions. And I look at the watch function and I said, oh, this is like dynamically corrected gates because they're doing a gate and they're suppressing errors. Then I look closely and I said, no, this is concatenated uh, decoupling. Turns out that concatenated sequences are including the Walsh sequences. So here's the Walsh propagators from order 0 to 31. 0 is free propagator. 1 is like a single echo in the middle. 2 is more echoes. 3 is like a CPMG and so on. Okay. And it seems that it's really easy to make this on a circuit. This is from an old paper, Walsh functions and digital Fourier series. The uh, numbering that uh, he's using here is different from the numbering that I'm using here. There are different orderings for Walsh functions. I don't know, maybe this is easy. I don't understand anything of this. They look like fours, but yeah. So it's easy to make them according to the electronics people. Well, the reason why it's uh, easy to make them is that they correspond to binary uh, frequencies. That is frequency one, frequency two, frequency four, and these are easy to make via digital electronics. And that's why they're nice, and you just have to combine these binary free produce any of the watch functions that you want. So there's another attractiveness about the WDD functions, which is that, as I said, if you want to go to, say, from an interval zero, uh, from time zero to a time two to the n times tau, you would require, you would end up with two to the n, two to the two to the n possible sequence. But if you only look at the watch sequences that apply in this running time, there's only two to the n of them. And they shrink the search space exponentially. The search space is what we were looking for when we were finding the BADD sequences, which were nice, <laughs> not bad. So let's uh, use the watch functions to have a look at the search space. So these plots correspond to the error values for applying the watch function from orders one to order five, 12, so I had it for 2048, but I messed up my presentation, so I had to renew it. This, this search takes about my laptop. The green points correspond to the local minima, which in this case, the local minima is the minimum error in that time range, say between eight to 16 or 16 to 32. And these are the binary representations of these, the indices of these watch functions, it's like this. So they. So one is echo, this one is CPMG, this one is CDD2, and this is CDD3. This one is CDD3 repeated, CDD3 repeated twice, repeated more and more and more. So they all correspond to CDD3. So you won't need to go beyond CDD3, you just have to repeat CDD3 in this case. Okay, so this is soft cutoff. So this is just uh, how many sequences we have and how many watch sequences we have and how many optimal sequences. Now, if you change the cutoff to be hard, just change the integral that you're evaluating for each point, you get another pattern and a set of optimal values. But again, the search takes is very quick. You can look at a very large uh, span of sequences in this way. And here, you get some irregularities in the Walsh basis. You don't get the CDD. You get it up to a point, but then there's a CDD, which is repeated and then concatenated again. So you get all these combinations of concatenations and repetitions here. And then here you're just trying to find the best ones. Do you have to concatenate or repeat or concatenate again? That's the idea here. Okay. So this idea of repetition is very nice because repeating a sequence effectively changes the spectral density of the environment. So you could start with an ohmic environment and you apply a sequence and then you repeat it. And what happens is that when you're looking at the long time behavior, you are really looking at the zero frequency or the filter function. And by applying a sequence and repeating it, you can adjust the power law of the spectral density. So here's the formula for repeating some sequence, that is, fp corresponds to the filter function of some sequence, and then you repeat it m times. 
you get this expression. And if this function behaves nicely, you can get rid of it when m goes to infinity. This is the Riemann Lebesgue level. Then you get this adjusted filter function for when you repeat the sequence at infinity. It's similar to the old expression. You get this extra sine squared in the end. And you can play with this and substitute the order of error suppression and some other, uh, the power law of the environment. And you get a condition for coherent saturation. So let's just quickly look at this. If it's free evolution, alpha is zero, then the condition for coherent uh, saturation is S greater than two. So you need to be really supraomic to be in the Bacon, in the Bacon uh, regime. If you use like a uh, echo sequence, then you add one here so you can be in a lower uh, power law and still get the coherent saturation. So why are we interested in the coherent saturation? Coherent saturation means a guarantee of coherence. And that's what's really interesting because you can not just reduce the errors, but you can maintain them for a long time. And we've seen this in almost all of the decoupling talks that I've heard in this, well, maybe many of them, that people can actually get T2 times that are keep growing until you hit T1. And that's the idea. You just keep increasing the coherence time. Okay. So let me go back to my Walsh uh, functions and look at the value of the error I get for a single sequence, which is the red one, and if I repeat it infinitely many num number of times, which is the green stuff. The blue region is the region where it's useless. The error is too large, I don't want it. The green, well, and the different graphs correspond to different values of the infinite. So obviously repeating a sequence increases the error, but not necessarily by a large factor. And sometimes you can, there's some sort of thing going on here. I don't know what it is, okay? That's just for illustration. So the reason why we think uh, the, it's important to think about long-time coherence and think about bandwidth adapted long-time dynamical decoupling is that dynamical decoupling adjusts the power law of the noise and the limits that we have found for decoupling do not depend on the total time. They only depend on the control capabilities. So if that is really true, then you, could be a, you should be able to get a nice quantum memory that operates at your best available fidelities for a very long time. And if you, ter if you, if you ended up repeating a sequence to achieve this long time limit, then you have something uh, nice because you, if you're repeating a sequence, you can sample it at any time. You don't need to wait for the sequence to finish to sample it. You have a low latency uh, quantum memory. It sounds obvious, but it's really important because you cannot really sample like a long and elaborate sequence in the middle of it because you'll always end up with a large error in the middle of the sequence. Repeating a sequence, you can always uh, sample at the very end of the sequence that you're repeating at any point, okay? But which sequence shall we repeat, actually? So here's uh, two uh, sequences that are being repeated. One of them is UDD6, and one of them is UDD10. UDD10 is the best sequence for this minimum switching time, which is pi over 64 in units of omega c, while UDD6 is not. So as you see, with, with single repeats, UDD10 does much better than UDD6. But if you keep repeating, the error for UDD10 re being repeated keeps increasing, and it does actually saturate, but at 10 to minus six. Well, six, which starts with a bigger error, saturates at a much smaller value. So the choice of the sequence to repeat is not trivial. And you can actually get four orders of magnitude of difference in the error by, doing the, by choosing the right sequence to repeat. And here's just a comparison of the BADD versus BALDD or BALD for the long time. So BALDD is that you take the error for the sequence and then you repeat it many times using the formula and you plot the error. And for th this graph corresponds to this previous picture. So the green curve here has a minimum value at UDD6, while the red one, which corresponds to a single cycle, has a minimum at UDD10. But if you t took UDD10 and repeated it, you would end up at 10 minus six. Anyway, it's four actually. Okay. So I'm um, uh, done. So here is that we know that the company can effectively adjust the spectral measure and the environment. 
And the main, uh, the main, our main finding is that the delimit is always bounded by a non-trivial function of the noise bandwidth and our control capabilities. And we have found ways of maintaining that small errors for long times. And I have to mention the Walsh uh, decoupling sequences, which are based on the simplicity of generation in terms of electronics, because they're very easy to generate using binary circuits. So here's our uh, acknowledgement and our collaborators. Thank you very much for your attention. All right, so an unexpected consequence of DD theory is uh, the ability to prove theorems in number theory? Uh, apparently, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Any questions? Thanks. Uh, I like really how you uh, set the goals for your sequences. I think that's very helpful for us. Uh, if I understand correctly, you always assume perfect pulses, is it right? Yeah, this is uh, really limited to the, the simplest but non-trivial regime. Yeah. Do we know what would be the Walsh function of infinite order or of very high order? Does it have any structure? So they look it? very uh, like a uh, fractal. But then the other thing is that they are a base, an overcomplete basis for functions on the interval. Yeah, so they don't look that, like yeah. anything yeah. because they're like a basis. So it doesn't have any particular structure. Okay. Yeah, there's no convergence. Yeah. Okay, thank you. More questions? So uh, the fact this uh, lower bound uh, on dynamical decoupling, is it somehow related to the fact that we're not extracting entropy? I mean, trying to pinpoint the difference between this and fault tolerance. Uh, I believe that that's the difference, yeah. Because it, as long as you don't have an entropy sink, there is no threshold. But I mean, I really cannot prove this. It's a big statement, so. Okay, but yeah, that so that's difference. what I was getting at. Is it, is it, do you see a path to uh, connecting this to no entropy extraction, uh, this, um, uh, your approach? Well, no, but there's another idea that uh, in th this was suggested to me by David Poulin, that there are cases where uh, normal uh, quantum record encodes do not work, which is like if you just have a coupling to a single qubit Hamiltonian, and you know that it's such a non-Markovian system that most codes will not work for that. But decoupling works perfectly for that. And the other regime where you just have a Markovian environment and decoupling doesn't work at all. And it seems that in one case you have a threshold case, you might also get a threshold, which I'm not sure, but there might be a trade-off or some sort of entropy argument from here, from the Markovianness of the environment. Okay. Oh, maybe one more. Just to comment on that, I mean, if your environment is sufficiently simple, you might be able to, to get zero error literally just by reversing the, yeah, uh, the evolution of the environment, yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah. All right, so thanks again, Kevin. <laughs> and as if the surface code people could really take another DD talk, here we go. Last DD talk for today. <laughs> <laughs>